a migraine. With Nurtec ODT, I found relief. The only migraine medication that helps treat and prevent all in one. To those with migraine, I see you. For the acute treatment of migraine with or without aura and the preventive treatment of episodic migraine in adults. Don't take if allergic to Nurtec ODT. Allergic reactions can occur even days after using. Most common side effects were nausea, indigestion, and stomach pain. It's time we all shine. Talk to a healthcare provider about Nurtec ODT from Pfizer. Tomorrow on ET, our bad boys exclusive with Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. Plus, only we're on set for young Sheldon's big goodbye. Bazinga. Oh, it's more like Bazinga. Let me cheer you up with the best in show. Yes. Congrats to Sage, a miniature poodle, and the first female dog to win the Westminster title since 2020. We were with Sage, who, by the way, was 45 minutes late to our interview because she needed some extra grooming. Be on time, girl. Diva girl. Bye, everybody. Happening now. A mishap with an airplane has all eyes focused on this airstrip in the middle of a neighborhood. I'll tell you what people say it's like to live on the edge of the flight path. Challenge accepted. President Biden and former President Donald Trump will meet on the debate stage. Coming up, just how soon that's expected to happen and how this debate could look different. Morning dampness soon returns along with the chance of a few storms. I'll be back to talk about where we're most likely to see severe storms and hot and sunny weekend. The News at 5 starts right now. And first at five, not something you see every day, an airplane in the middle of a neighborhood street, but that's exactly what neighbors here saw at an airstrip. The small plane skidding off of the runway. It landed right there in the middle of the street. Katrina Weber reports some still say this close encounter is no cause for concern. In a place meant for cars, a small plane has come to rest. The private aircraft ended up on Hymer Road, not far from Brook Hollow, yesterday afternoon, instead of inside Twin Oaks Airport. Police officers at the scene said the pilot failed to stop at the end of the runway. Meanwhile, near the other end of it, Roland Rios got a call from his wife. She was on the way home from picking up the grandkids from school, and she alerted me about the accident. So then I rushed out to take a quick look. While the mishap was unexpected, it wasn't exactly a surprise to Rios, who has lived in the flight path more than 20 years. We knew the landing strip was there when we moved in. It uh, didn't cause us any concern. Rio says the airstrip really is just part of the neighborhood. It's been here as long as he can remember. In fact, when he first moved in, this fence wasn't even here. I saw how close it was to our house, but nothing, you know, that I'm worried about. I feel like it's just a freak accident. Garrett Townsend shrugs it off, too, although he's heard stories from a pilot friend who lands here occasionally. He said uh, out of all the runways he's taken off and landed that it's uh, definitely the toughest. The strip is nestled among homes and tall trees, less than a third the length of San Antonio International's runway and about 30 feet wide. There was an accident once before. I was pressure washing the sidewalk and the plane came down and the I think the front tire collapsed. Just as in that case, officers yesterday said no one was hurt. What went wrong is still being investigated. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. New at 5, San Antonio has been cleared for launch. Military C City USA can now get direct flights to the nation's capital. This afternoon, Congress passed the FAA reauthorization bill, which adds five round-trip flights to Reagan National Airport. State and city leaders have been pushing for this for years. American Airlines is now stepping up, saying they're applying to get those routes from San Antonio International. Something called the perimeter rule has kept San Antonio from having direct access to D.C. in the past. This rule restricts direct flights into Reagan National to within 1,250 miles of that airport. San Antonio is 1,600 miles away. But passing this bill today allows San Antonio to be included. It was shut down since this morning, and it still is. The Pelican Island Causeway Bridge in Galveston, Texas, remains closed after this barge crashed right into it, sending a section of the bridge into the water and causing an oil spill as well. All this according to reports from our sister station, KPRC in Houston. The bridge is the only road that connects Galveston Island to Pelican Island, but right now the only way off of Pelican Island is by boat. Pelican Island, home to Texas A&M at Galveston, which temporarily lost power following this barge crash. 
No injuries reported, though, and until further notice, the bridge is closed in both directions as structural engineers from TxDOT determine if it's safe to use. KPRC reporting the U.S. Coast Guard, meantime, has been called in to help clean up a spreading oil spill. The president of the San Antonio Police Officers Association is pushing back on criticism from within his own organization. Some members have blasted Danny Diaz's de decision to accept $30,000 earlier this year for Blue Care, Sapoa's nonprofit arm. That money came from Precinct 1 Bear County Commissioner Rebecca Clay Flores. Clay Flores has twice been endorsed by the Texas Organizing Project, a political nemesis of the police union. One former SOPOA committee member said the move from Diaz was a slap in the face to the rank and file. We go out every day to do a job that not many want to do. And to have individuals that are supposed to represent us behave in this manner is not acceptable. Coming up at six o'clock today, Sapoa declines to make an endorsement in the race for Precinct 1, even though Clay Flores' opponent run Blue Cares. We'll have that story today at six. About six months ago, the road to the White House was slated to go right through San Marcos on the campus of Texas State University. It's the alma mater of Lyndon B. Johnson, the 36th president of the United States. The university was picked to host the first presidential debate if and when candidates agreed to debate at all. That first debate was supposed to be in September, but there are changes now to when and where those debates will happen. After weeks of former President Donald Trump calling on President Joe Biden to join him on the debate stage, Biden today accepted and agreed to a face off next month. Our Washington correspondent Julia Benbrook joins us live from the White House. So Julia, sounds like we'll see a couple of presidential debates this cycle. That's right. And as you mentioned, this comes after weeks of will they, won't they. Biden is now making it clear that he wants to meet Trump on the debate stage and sooner than expected. This comes after Trump had regularly stated that he would debate any time, any place. The two candidates have agreed to two debates, one in June and one in September. There's been a lot of debate about the debate schedule, but on Wednesday, President Joe Biden said he wants to meet former President Donald Trump on the debate stage sooner rather than later. I'll even do it twice. So let's pick the dates, Donald. I hear you're free on Wednesdays. The Commission on Presidential Debates had three official debates on the calendar starting in mid-September. But the Biden campaign says that the president will not be participating in the committee's announced debate dates. Instead, he's pushing for debates hosted by news organizations, one in June and one in September, pointing to the timeline of early voting as one reason to move the schedule up. I think we're ready to go. The American people deserve to see uh, both of these candidates argue their case on the merits uh, well before people actually go and cast their ballots. Trump has been pushing for a while now for the debates with Biden to start earlier. Anytime, any place, we'll do it any way you want, Joe. Trump quickly responded to Biden's new challenge, writing that he's ready and willing to debate at the two proposed times. The two agreed to start with a June 27th debate hosted by CNN in the battleground state of Georgia. There will be no studio audience, a critical change in format that the Biden campaign believes will make the debates less of a spectacle. Trump says he would prefer, quote, for excitement purposes, a very large venue. The Biden team is also proposing a vice presidential debate to take place in late July after Trump has officially selected a running mate. Reporting live at the White House, Julia Benbrook, KSAT 12 News. And we did get an update from Texas State. That first debate, the only one that has been listed with a venue or a site. The proposed site for the second debate has not been announced. And here's Texas State University's idea about all of these changes that are underway. They say that they have not been told anything about the campus uh, not being able to have that debate. And they say they are aware of the latest developments surrounding the presidential debates and they are working closely with the Commission on Presidential Debates as they assess the situation. When we know anything new, we're going to share it with you on air as well as online at KSAT.com. 
U.S. Congressional District 23, not just one of the biggest districts in the country, it's also one of the most contested, something Congressman Tony Gonzalez can attest to as he's seeking his third term in that office that represents people from the edge of San Antonio all the way west to El Paso. Gonzalez won't get that third term, though, or even a shot at it if he doesn't defeat challenger Brandon Herrera in the Republican primary runoff in a little less than two weeks. Gonzalez did a sit-down interview with Steve Spreester for the latest Spreester sessions, saying that he stands by his record despite finding himself facing four other people from within his own party in the March primary. The retired Navy vet was the top vote getter in that contest, but he didn't hit that 50% threshold to win it outright. Coming in second was Brandon Herrera, a YouTube personality and a gun manufacturer, all setting up the runoff on May 28th. Gonzalez, who was censured by his own party for past votes, said that he wouldn't change anything about his voting record. You look at my voting record, my, vo my voting record is very strong on the Constitution. Once again, I swore an oath to the Constitution at 18 years old and I've never stopped doing that, right? And I've worked really hard to go, look, we can protect the Constitution and we can protect our kids. It does not have to be either or. Our requests for an interview with Gonzalez's challenger, Brandon Herrera, went unanswered. To see the entire Spreester Sessions interview with District 23 Congressman Tony Gonzalez, just click the QR code you see right there in the corner of your screen. The danger is real, and apparently it's getting more real every year. New CDC numbers showing that for the first time since 2019, there's been an increase in drowning deaths in the U.S., the CDC pointing to the almost 40 million Americans who don't know how to swim. Eric Hernandez breaks down which groups are most at risk and what's being done here in San Antonio to encourage everyone to learn water safety. The sounds of summer are upon us. The rise in temps mean more of us will be heading to the pool, lake, river, or beach. But one thing many of us may not know is how to swim. The latest CDC numbers show that between 2020 to 2022, 4,500 people died from drowning. Those numbers increasing for the first time since 2019. More than 40 million Americans do not know how to swim. According to the CDC, over half have never taken a swimming lesson. Let's break those numbers down by demographic. 63% of black adults and 72% of Hispanic adults have reported never taken a swimming lesson. What we try to do is make it as accessible as possible um, to uh, you know, get skills and confidence um, around water um, uh, for everyone in San Antonio. The YMCA of Greater San Antonio is on a mission to provide the opportunity to teach the community how to swim, especially teaching about water safety. Water safety lessons is big, especially starting in the summer. Um, so today is actually uh, International Water Safety Day, uh, so kicking that off. So all throughout the month, um, starting in May, we're offering free water safety lessons. All you have to do is uh, sign up online and reserve um, your free class. The city of San Antonio also offers free group swim lessons. The Let's Swim SA program launches later this summer. There's also the U.S. National Water Safety Action Plan in place to hire diverse aquatic staff that look like the communities they serve and programs being created to meet specific needs. As for some basic safety tips, don't swim alone if you're not confident. Even if children have had some lessons, always supervise when in or around water. Build fences that usually enclose and separate the pool from the house. Wear a life jacket. Don't drink alcohol while swimming and learn CPR skills. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. This is the camera Highway 151 at West Military. You can see on the access road there a bunch of cones lined up. The access road down to one lane with that police cruiser there and a fire truck. Could be an accident that was in the clearing stages. Hopefully that gets cleared up and things are back to fully open on the access road off of West Military. We have some thin clouds moving overhead. Usually they set the stage for a beautiful sunset. They may be too much of a good thing for parts of our area, but keep your eyes peeled out there over the next couple of hours. And I do want to point out on the visible satellite imagery, see how these clouds are a little thicker up above us in parts of Mexico and close to the, to the Rio Grande. There was initially some thought that maybe a few storms could pop up in Mexico and cross the border and even the remnants make it here. I don't think that's going to happen just because of the lack of uh, heating that these 
clouds are causing. They're keeping them from keep from popping those storms out west, keeping the sun from heating it up enough. 60, 96 in Del Rio, 92 in shirts. For the most part, low to mid 90s, 90 in Bulverde right now, and, and 93 near Lavernia. As we go through the evening, temperatures falling through the 80s and then down into the 70s, turning damp. That's the key. We'll talk about the dampness for the morning commute and storm chances in just a bit, Ursula. Thank you, Adam. Still ahead on KSAT 12 News at 5, the Girl Scouts of Southwest Texas holding an unveiling right here in the Alamo City today, marking a milestone as they honor one of their very own in a very special way and more. That story after the break. Twenty twenty four is a big year for the Girl Scouts of Southwest Texas. The chapter is celebrating its one hundred year anniversary. And what better way to commemorate that than with a massive mural commemorating the chapter centennial? That mural is right in the heart of downtown San Antonio at Main Plaza and Market Street. Several Girl Scouts, alumni and families of accomplished scouts were on hand for the unveiling. And that includes Kimberly Garcia, the mother of Amory Joe Garza, one of the Robb Elementary victims. The Girl Scouts of the USA honored Amory posthumously with the bronze cross, which is pictured on her sash in the mural, as well as some badges that she might have earned as a Girl Scout, all picked by her mom. It's bittersweet, obviously, because I don't want her to be there, but I'm very proud of her. The mural's artist was Christina Noriega, the same artist who painted Amory Joe's mural in Uvalde. Take a look outside with the live cam. We are heating things up. It's 91 degrees, but thank goodness there's some clouds out there, Adam. Yeah, a little bit of natural shade in it. They're helping to inhibit the storm formation out in Mexico, which, you know, wouldn't be bad to get some of that rain make its way across the Rio Grande and parts of our area, but I don't think you have to plan around it this evening. However, expect a damp morning commute and then storm chances by midday tomorrow. Otherwise, a stretch of sunny and hotter days. Let's get right into the details. First of all, here's where the action is at the moment. Severe weather threat. Lubbock to Amarillo, up to Guymon, Oklahoma. So up in the Panhandle, that's where we have the severe threat. Our next system is still off to the west, same one we've been talking about. It's near Phoenix right now and Tucson. This counterclockwise upper level swirl, that's slowly pushing our way and it's gonna help throw some energy into Texas and we'll be right on the edge of the action, but we should be close enough to tap in to at least some of the showers and thunderstorms. Let's start with first thing tomorrow. Low gray clouds, damp, not so much drizzly as sprinkly, if that makes any sense. Passing sprinkles and a few very light showers. Then we get closer to the noon hour midday and that's when storm chances start to come into the picture. First in the hill country, at noon and then shortly thereafter we could see some of that action move into San Antonio. Don't, don't pay too close attention to the exact location at the given time. Just the mere fact that the model as well as picking up on scattered activity midday, early afternoon and then most likely tapering off late in the afternoon and early evening. Then we could have another hit of a few, sto few storms as we go into Friday, but better odds tomorrow. Severe weather threat tomorrow. San Antonio in that isolated category. So a one on a scale of one to five, just north of town, roughly San Marcos to Kerrville, Austin and northward. That's where it's a two out of five. Slightly more likely in terms of severe weather in the central and west Texas here. Uh, you see this yellow area covered. We're right on the edge of that action. As is often the case, most of the rain but even the severe potential is gonna be just to the north of us. So 40% chance tomorrow, Friday, a 30% chance. After that, 0%, the goose egg, 0% because it's nothing but sunshine. So sprinkles in the morning, a few light showers, 72. By the noon hour, see those storm chances start to creep in and that'll be the case through the afternoon at 40%. 86 degrees, the high temperature, thick humidity as well. You'll really notice the stickiness. We could still make it to triple digits out west along the Rio Grande tomorrow. Storm chances are lower along the along the Rio Grande. Del Rio 101, even Catula 97 for the high temperature. Meanwhile, 86 Lackland, 84 Converse, Stone Oak, 84 the high. Looking ahead, we talked about that sunny, hotter weekend. 
Talking 97 for high temperatures Saturday and Sunday. Starting to Ooh. feel a little more summer-like. Mm -hmm. Feeling more brutal. <laughs> Thank you. Coming. All right, thanks, Adam. Okay, rumors surrounding the Spurs, Larry. Yeah, go figure, right? Oh, so yeah. one of the rumors is the Spurs and Hawks could work out a trade to send Trey Young here to San Antonio. And you know what? What does Victor Wimbanyama have to think about that? Well, an NBA on ESPN podcast will issue up their thoughts. Plus, Nikola Jokic, you know what? He really played like the MVP last night. He was on fire coming up. The Spurs rumors about making a deal for Hawks point guard Trey Young are alive and kicking. The Young trade rumors were doused with kerosene after the Hawks won the NBA draft lottery. Now the Woj says the Hawks talking about trading Young are very real. And according to the Hoop Collective podcast on ESPN, Wimby is fascinated by Trey joining the Spurs. It would be shocking if Trey Young and DeJounte Murray are teammates again next year. Possible Trey Young destination to San Antonio Spurs. I will say that I have talked to people who know Wimby, who have indicated that he is at least intrigued by that idea. I have no idea whether Greg Popovich would be intrigued by the idea. He's and, not and classically a Popovich player, Trey Young. From a basketball perspective, I think it could really work. Culturally are the questions. And it's not like, hey, Trey, are you okay being the number two guy? No. Trey, do you embrace being the sidekick? It's not one and two. It is, this is the face of the franchise, and you are here to enhance him and maximize his talents. Obviously, there are a lot, a lot of doubts about that. And turning to the NBA playoffs, Denver Nuggets center Nikola Jokic received his NBA MVP trophy last night before Game 5 of their playoff series with the Minnesota Timberwolves. And once the game tipped, Nikola took over, scoring a game-high 40 points to go with 13 assists in 41 minutes. Nuggets win 112-97, taking a 3-2 series lead. And how about this? Nikola went 8-9 for nine when guarded by Defensive Player of the Year, Rudy Gobert. You know, like I said, you said it good. Some some of the shots were really tough. Some of the shots was uh, um, shots I think I can make. So I mean, um, he's a he's a he's a good defender. Um, always makes you to do like a little bit more, and sometimes you need to make a tough shot. Game six is tomorrow night in Minnesota at 7.30. The NBA champs are one run away from the Western Conference Finals. Caitlin Clark scored 20 points in her WNBA regular season debut last night. Melissa Smith had 13 points and nine boards for Indiana. But the Sun beat the Fever 92-71. to Clark also had a game-high 10 turnovers. Obviously too many turnovers. Um, that's not going to get the job done, but I think just a lot of things to learn from. I didn't think we played well. and. And the Fever will look to rebound tomorrow night when they host the Liberty. All right. Thank you, Larry. We'll be right back. Check out Rockin' Rod's photo from Divine earlier this morning. Morning coffee, wake up. Peaceful and love it. And it's those cirrus clouds that were giving us that nice sunrise. And I do think some of us will get a nice sunset as well from the cirrus clouds that are rolling overhead, those high, thin clouds. Sunset, by the way, 8.20 p.m. Boy, it feels like it was just 7 p.m. just yesterday. Anyway, that's all changed. Okay, <laughs> mid-80s tomorrow, upper 80s on Friday. Then this weekend, and even into next week, we're well into the 90s. Going to feel a little more July-like. 97, Saturday and Sunday. Thank you, Adam, and thank you for watching the Music 5 with us. We'll see you right back here at 6 o'clock.